libraries and indigenous commun communities part two. Uh, myself and Faith uh, will be facilitating today's session. My name is Kayla Van Austin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a research and instruction librarian and the assistant archivist at Widener. Uh, and I'm Faith Charlton. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the lead processing archivist for Manuscripts Division Collections at Princeton University Library. Uh, we recognize that the land on which PAC school member institutions stand is the traditional ancestral territory of the Lenape people who have been the inhabitants of this land since time immemorial. We invite in attendees outside of the Philadelphia area to consider the people whose land you are on. One resource to do that is native-land.ca, which Kayla just put in the chat. Um, some housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, as you can see, we, uh, we will be recording today's session and uh, the Q&A. Um, closed captioning has been enabled. Um, and we ask that attendees please type your questions for the speakers in the chat box. Uh, and we will be using progressive stacking. So we would ask that those who would like to self-identify as a member of an underrepresented community, include an asterisk at the beginning of their question, and we will prioritize uh, those submissions for the Q&A. Um, and yeah, sorry about that hiccup with the Eventbrite Zoom link. Hopefully everyone um, got the, the email and is now has now joined us. Um, so I think we can get started. Okay, great. So our first speaker is Allison Mills, who is Elilu Cree from the Chapel Cree First Nation. She's a, the college archivist for Bryn Mawr College and previously worked at the University of British Columbia's Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Allison will discuss how standard library cataloging practices don't accurately represent indigenous people's histories, cultures, and languages usually classifying material related to indigenous communities as historical and how alternative cataloging methodology pushes back against practices with uh, which perpetuate harmful stereotypes about indigenous peoples. All right, take it away, Allison. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I am just going to share my screen. Can, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Great, thank yes. you. Uh, okay, so um, as Kayla said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about cataloging and classification today. Um, I tried to make my title a pun with calcification, um, but is not a typo. Uh, I realized that it kind of looks like that. Um, because we have a a lot of people talking about some very cool archival initiatives today. I wanted to bring a library perspective to the conversation as well. Um, I think that awareness that both the Library of Congress or LC subject headings and call numbers and classification is problematic isn't new. When it comes to records relating to indigenous communities in North America specifically, many metadata and cataloging librarians have been working really hard to balance the creation of MARC records that are simultaneously discoverable, functional, and not overtly offensive. Um, but there are, like, they've been doing that work for a long time. But I think that. Um, Many people, especially if they don't work in a library that specializes in indigenous materials, which is where I was working when I was first exposed to a lot of these issues, um, might not be aware of how LC treats indigenous materials. So today I'm going to go over some of those issues and then also talk about some potential ways of um, pushing back against them. Um, building off of the work that other Indigenous librarians and their allies have been doing for years. Um, so let's begin by talking about the e-schedule. This classification, particular the E99s, is used for pretty much any material related to Indigenous peoples in North America. Um, a book could be talking about science or religion or technology, but instead of ending up 
in the Q's or the B's or the T's, if it's indigenous science or indigenous religion or indigenous technology, it'll more than likely end up in the E's under Indians of North America. Although the E's are generally used to classify um, North American history when you go up on like a higher level, um, that Indian tribes and cultures section does a lot of heavy lifting. So if you're talking about spirituality, that's culture. Agriculture, also culture. This grouping creates a fundamental marginalization of material within the library. It implies that indigenous peoples and our cultures are something from the past because we're classified under history, even if you're looking at a book that's talking about like contemporary art. So because Indigenous material is often classified in the ease, people browsing the stacks, uh, either in person or as you can see here virtually, um, are not necessarily going to be able to use browsing in the same way that someone who is looking in like for here for plants in the QKs uh, could. Um, even if you make it to this particular text that's on screen, um, uh, none of the books around it have anything to do with Koya botany. As a researcher interested in Indigenous botany, you then have to navigate uh, keywords and subject headings to find what you're looking for in a way that people who are interested in Western botany and are just looking at books on a shelf don't have to do. It sets a further barrier to entry that again, marginalizes indigenous material and collections, and in cases that feature outdated subject headings can also uh, perpetuate harm. Although the subject headings on this record aren't terrible, they're also not super helpful for someone who's interested in indigenous botanical knowledge um, in what is now Southern California. That researcher would have to do a lot of digging that other researchers don't have to do. Um, so what might librarians do to help address some of this? Uh, some things are pretty basic, like looking into changes proposed by the American Indian Library Association or at alternative vocabularies to round out our collective knowledge. Having a vetted set of rules to turn to can help enrich our catalogs in places where LC falls short. In particular, the local subject heading 690 field allows for flexibility in cataloging that might otherwise be difficult to include. For example, LC uses historical terms for many indigenous nations. Um, on screen, you can see the authority record for uh, Kwakutl Indians, whose actual self-identified name is Kwakwa. Self-determination for Indigenous peoples is a huge component of respecting our sovereignty and our authority as experts on our own communities. One that sometimes means pushing aside Western notions of literary warrant as outdated because of the weight that it gives published work about, but not by Indigenous peoples. Uh, examples of thesauri that privilege Indigenous peoples' right to control their own naming are the First Nations House of Learning Thesaurus, the First Nations Métis Inuit Indigenous Ontology, the Maori Subject Headings Thesaurus, and the Getty Union List of Artist Names, which I include here because it includes nation names and affiliation for Indigenous artists. So all of these are possible resources for creating more representative catalog records on Indigenous materials. All right, Allison, uh, and although, you, sorry, you have about a minute left. Okay, I'm almost done. Thank you. Um, although legacy cataloging makes it difficult to rectify the extreme grouping together that happens in the E schedule, I think it's worth considering the impact that cataloging new acquisitions according to subject matter holistically and not just sticking them in the E's might have. Um, and uh, as with the application of subject headings, there are many institutions and individual librarians who have been working on alternative classification schemes, some which have fully replaced LC and Dewey. For example, the Wewa Library at the University of British Columbia, where I used to work, adapted the Brian Deere classification scheme for an entirely indigenous focused collection. And you know, that's not 
practical for everybody, but I think it's something that you can look to as an example of how other systems don't segregate material based on race the way that LC does. And because I'm a librarian, I'm going to read you, leave you with some recommended reading, uh, which I will leave in the chat. But I highly recommend these two uh, issues. One of them, uh, the Cataloging and Classification Quarterly uh, uh, Indigenous Knowledge Organization special issue focuses more on library resources. And then the Archival Science uh, issue focuses on archives uh, and Indigenous human rights. Um, and I will, I will end my presentation here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Allison. That was great. And it's good to get a library perspective, <laughs> not just archives. So thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jim Garantzer, who is the college archivist at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Jim has led numerous digital projects over his career, including the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, which was launched in 2013. The center brings together material from various repositories, sharing more than 300,000 pages of digitized documents, photographs, newspapers, financial le ledgers, and other records that shed light on the experiences of the 7,800 students who attended the Carlisle Indian School, as well as on the general operations of the school. So take it away, Jim. Thank you. There, I need to unmute myself. Uh, everybody can see my screen? Excellent. So uh, the idea for the Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center grew out of the need to make it easier for people who wish to do research on the Carlisle Indian School uh, to find information easily accessible online. Uh, previously, uh, descendants of Carlisle Indian School students uh, either contacted the Cumberland County Historical Society located here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, or they um, contacted the National Archives in Washington, DC and requested records there, which is somewhat cumbersome um, or traveled, which could be very costly. So the idea was to bring information together online and make the discovery process a lot easier. Uh, so thanks to a grant from the Mellon Foundation in 2013, we began sending teams of undergraduates to the National Archives in Washington, DC to digitize records held uh, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs record group for the Carlisle Indian School. Uh, so the records that were digitized have been organized by the major record types. Um, we, we designed the site really with users in mind and particularly descendants of Carlisle students. Uh, so uh, the student records themselves um, is the most heavily used section of the site. And for each individual record, there is a brief description of what can be found in the file and a PDF uh, that has the contents of the file and uh, always keeping in mind linking back to where a person can find the original document so you can see the repository and location information that can help any user get to the original documents if they're interested. Uh, and we'll just do a quick look at uh, how the PDFs then are presented. So that's one example of a student file. And again, there's 7,800 students. Uh, images, images are drawn from numerous repositories, Cumberland County Historical Society, the National Anthropological Archives, uh, the National Archives, the Library of Congress, uh, Dickinson College, and a few other places. So you can see the repository listed uh, whenever you browse through the collections. And if you uh, browse, you can also pick a particular nation or tribe. And so uh, here we've often uh, elected to keep multiple versions of the same image so that you can also get a sense of how images were created and distributed. So here there's a print of the Henry Phillips photo that's held by the Cumberland County Historical Society. Here's the original glass plate negative that's held at the National Anthropological Archives. And here's another 
sepia toned print that's in Henry Phillips' own file at the National Archives uh, in Washington, DC. So um, there are continuing to be lots of photographs added to the collection and um, there's been a lot of work to update the descriptions of the photos because previous descriptive information at um, the National, Anthropo at National Anthropological Archives was not as accurate because they didn't have access to all the physical documentation. Uh, the publication section has student newspapers um, and there were about uh, eight different titles over the years. There's also the annual reports uh, from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. And these are all full text searchable. So uh, this is uh, another source of information that previously scholars uh, had a much more difficult time accessing and family members as well. Descendants can do full text searches for a student's name and find a lot more information about a person's experiences while they were at Carlisle uh, than they're able to find otherwise. Uh, we also have the documents. Uh, the documents are any kind of administrative files you can imagine uh, there being, and uh, I'll select the Chicago World's Fair as a subject line so you can see Again, all kinds of documents about how Carlisle was going to be presented at the World's Fair uh, in 1893. And by the use of tags and everything else, uh, the documentation is easy to follow and um, easy for researchers to continue their research in other locales. Um, next, we have lists and ledgers. Um, oftentimes these ledgers that included things like admissions and um, discharge records, student uh, deaths. Uh, we have often transcribed these ledgers as well. So you can download uh, Excel spreadsheets and researchers can do their own sorting of that information. There's a section for teaching resources that various teachers and uh, professors have put together lesson plans to make it easier for um, K through 12 teachers to bring some information about the uh, assimilationist boarding school era into the classroom uh, without having to do too much of their own research on the topic. Um, we also created a cemetery information resource because there were so many questions about students who died while they were at Carlisle. And uh, some of you may have seen in recent years that there's been a process for families to request that remains uh, be repatriated to their home communities. So that has been a program going on now since 2017. And uh, there's a documentary about the first student remains to be repatriated uh, that showed on PBS's independent lens uh, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And I think that will be rebroadcast in uh, January. Sorry to um, cut you off, Jim. You have a little less than a minute left. Okay. There was also a program called Outing in which students from Carlisle were sent out into the wider community. This was part of the assimilation experiment of further separating them uh, from uh, not only their families, but also from their fellow students. Uh, sometimes information is held in other repositories, particular in the PAC school region. So this is a file that was donated by the Drexel University Archives, showing information about a student from Carlisle who then attended um, school at Drexel and graduated from Drexel. Uh, the Mercer Museum recently contacted us about files that they have. The uh, Balderston family hosted outing students, so they will be digitizing some of their records to share that will show how um, students were then sent out into the community. And the last thing I wanted to mention is in the PAC school region, there was also an Indian boarding school. Uh, it was known both as the Educational Home for Boys and also the Lincoln Institute, uh, originally started as an orphanage for uh, Civil War veterans children's. Uh, the educational home then by the 1880s um, started being a place for um, taking in Native American students and operated for about 20 years. 
information on the Lincoln Institute is very difficult to find. We managed to find this one pamphlet, a 16th annual report, which does list all the students who are enrolled at that time. But if any of you in your repositories have information or know more about the educational home or the Lincoln Institute, that's something we'd also be very interested in talking about because that's something that many descendants are anxious to learn more about as well. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, and just a reminder um, for those coming in, um, if you have any questions for our presenters, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the, at the end. Okay, our next presenters are Jerry Simmons and Ia Bull. Jerry is the National Archives and Records Administration External Agency Liaison to SNAC or Social Networks and Archival Context as a project of NARA's Office of Innovation and Cooperative Leadership with the University of Virginia Library. Ia Bull is a queer third gender archivist and scholar and a member of indigenous Gaduagi and Natchez communities. They will talk about SNAC and its cooperative approach to forefronting and sharing data about cultural heritage collections worldwide. Okay, thank you, Keila, for the introduction. Uh, hoping everyone can see the screen just fine. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, forefronting indigenous identities in, with SNAC. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Yamasee and their indigenous kin and neighbors on whose traditional territories I live and work. I acknowledge the devastation of colonial warfare and cultural genocide that separated these nations and all indigenous peoples in North America from control of their homelands. I acknowledge the continued pr presence and resilience of indigenous communities and nations today. And I thank those with whom I collaborate while undertaking my work for the National Archives and Records Administration. I'll start by explaining how SNAC is really two things. First, SNAC is a search engine which aggregates descriptions of entities uh, in EAC CPF or encoded archival description, corporate bodies, persons, and families description scheme. These descriptions, often called authority records, facilitate linked access to descriptions of archives, library, and museum collections, artifacts too, wherever the collections are found around the globe. SNAC also facilitates linking between entities, persons to persons, persons to families, corporate bodies to persons, persons to corporate bodies, and so on, in a very specific context. On this slide, we see a clip of the rec snack record from uh, Gladys Tantaquidgen. And on the resources tab of her snack record is a list of the resources in context as she's related to them, whether she is referenced in them as a subject or she is the actual creator of the collection. On the far right, you see the list of holding repositories the, um, where her collections are held. A simple click on one of the blue titles in the in the middle column there moves you to the description device or the EAD finding aid or a catalog record for those materials by and at that uh, institution. And this particular um, one, we have a, her collection highlighted from the National Museum of the American Indian and the description is located through the Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives. Second, SNAC is a vibrant cooperative community of archivists, librarians, museum professionals, and information scientists who work together promoting the economy of shared description of cultural heritage materials. The University of Virginia and the National Archives and Records Administration partner to lead the cooperative, which now counts 54 institutions among its members. Among our newest members are the Arquivo Nacional do Brazil, the National Archives of Brazil, and the Natchez Nation. Among SNAC's cooperative activities are annual partners meetings, the SNAC school training events, and most recently, the Indigenous SNAC Edit-a-thon. A typical SNAC authority record discovered via simple search looks as this. From the basic search page, you can type in a keyword or a formed heading. In this case, I've highlighted Thomas Yellowtail. A simple click on that brings you to a brief description of his, um, uh, or a clip out description from his snack record. Clicking on the, the, the blue link 
moves you directly to his record. Uh, there's an image when one, an image is available through Wiki Commons. Uh, we have an immediate link between the snack record and the Wiki data page so that you can see an image. And then on the, again, just like the Tantaquidgen example, there's a tab for resources. You can also use the view collection locations uh, button to have a visual map with pin drops of the physical locations of the collections. I'm going to quickly do a demonstration based on Jim Thorpe. And I'm going to expand my screen just a bit so I can see better. Notice that stack, Snack starts to look for the heading for you as you begin to type. Here are the results of that search. And then clicking there takes you immediately to Jim Thorpe's record. Again, there's a biography tab, a resources tab, which lists the collections that are related to him in context, relationships that describe contextual uh, links between Jim Thorpe and other entities also described in Snack, places immediately relevant to his story, and then a list of subject headings. Also occupations. On the resources tab, you can sort by repository. I'm going to And there I was narrowing down that repository list to National Museum so that I knew that I could find the National Museum of the American Indian and click there on that resource for the Wheaties boxes and clicking there moves you directly to the artifact description in Snack. And then we pull what pulls through is then um, information created by the National Museum of the American Indian. If you want to learn more about Snack and being involved in this descriptive cooperative, you can check out the portal at portal.snackcooperative.org slash about. And if you have questions directly for me, you can talk, contact me at the email at the bottom of the slide. Thank you very much. Over to Ia. Yeah. <laughs> Madoa Jerry. Um, let's see here. In Kololo, my group Sionagad. See if I can start the slideshow. I know I don't have a whole lot of time, um, so I'll just quickly move on through here. Um, I'm representing two different uh, institutions, both in collaboration with SNAC. But um, Tulsi Ginela, um, so Ahani. Uh, Ani Sasa Ayer, Jigesana, Jinail. I live in the ancestral homelands of the Wajaji or Osage people, um, but it is currently the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. Um, but I'm from Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and which is the uh, Cherokee Nation Reservation. That is that land there? So uh, I uh, work in collaboration with the Mapping Tahlequah History Project, which is a GIS um, mapping history that you can see that there's like the 23 locations over here. This is connected to, just so you guys have a general idea where Tahlequah, Oklahoma is. It's not a very big town, but it is the capital of Cherokee Nation. Um, so in working with Snack and particularly the Indigenous Editathon, I was really impressed with Snack's priorities with uh, Indigenous communities. So we're able to represent, so like Nachi folks are able to come in and like approve these records um, that I was able to participate in the Editathon. Um, and you can see in this record, um, well, there's certain uh, markers like uh, Nancy Raven, who is a cultural keeper and collaborator with Mary Haas, mostly a little bit with John Swanton in the early 1900s. Um, but rather than you know being identified as like 
one of the last Nazi speakers or identification of pedigree of blood quantum, we're able to actually talk about um, or use words that she would have cared about and what current community members care about, which is that she's a first language speaker of Nachi, that she's a member and clan mother of Greenleaf ceremonial grounds. Um, so we're able to kind of like retell the story a little bit with these um, edit-a-thons. So for mapping Tahlequah history, I've been able to pull a lot of the ideology of snack and the emphasis of um, equitable and ethical descriptions. Um, like their ethos statement was a really good example and kind of allowed me to contextualize it in a way that mapping Tahlequah histories as a digital humanities project, they're not uh, super down with the lingo of archival practice and information studies. So able to approach um, these sorts of protocols in that way was uh, important. So some useful tools in moving forward. I've also been working with the Nachi Nation directly for the Nachi in Digital, which is a community archive and digital cultural center that we're designing. Um, it's been in the works for a couple of years now, but all volunteer hours, and we recently got approved for a grant. So we're gonna be able to move this forward uh, at a much better speed um, and actually um, you know, work more with individual community members, not just the folks that are the loudest. So uh, some cool things that Snack provides um, is the resources that Jerry talked about earlier. Um, and this has been important for Mapping Tahlequah History, which on the right here, you can see Mapping Tahlequah History actually listed as a resource. Um, but it's something that we uh, at MTH have been able to utilize. And then over on the left is the visualizations, which I, I really love. Um, so that's the constel, well, that's the connection graphing for a constellation. And right here, we have the Sam family, which is a well-known Nachi family in Eastern, what's now considered Eastern Oklahoma. And you can see connections to other snack records of uh, particularly more well-known in the national context of John Reed Swanton, an uh, ethnographer and um, salvage anthropologist. And then you have Mary Haas, who's a decently well-known linguist uh, who worked a lot with uh, Nachi knowledge keepers. Um, so people are able to find, you know, these connections, whether they're looking at Mary Haas's work or Reed's work, uh, or they are Nachi community members and they can find the, the folks that worked with Nachi folks. Um, this brings me towards the end of the presentation, uh, just future plans for mapping Tahlequah history is becoming a snack member. You may have seen Jerry mentioning that uh, Nachi Nation is one of the newest members of the Snack Collective. So uh, I was really happy to get that recently approved. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Madog. Great, thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is Rosalie Hooper, uh, who's the interim head of interpretation of, uh, I'm sorry, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Rosalie's talk is about the collaborative process used to develop both a land acknowledgement statement and the display of several pieces of indigenous artwork in the newly opened early American art galleries at the PMA. She'll also focus on how they're hoping to further develop these processes into a commitment to indigenous communities held across the institution. Great. Thanks so much, Faith, and um, thanks to Paxful for inviting me to join this discussion and to um, our PMA representative, Marge, for making the connection to bring me here today. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Rosalie, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the head of interpretation at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I will be bringing a museum perspective to, um, in addition to our archives and libraries. Um, despite that, I do not have any visuals, so I will be uh, just, just sharing some thoughts about these processes with you today. Um, to begin, I will note with gratitude and humility that I recognize Philadelphia as part of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of Lenape peoples. A long history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements such as the walking purchase of 1737 displaced many of the Lenape from this land. 
I strive to understand both personally and as a museum employee my place within this legacy of colonization and to act as an ally to Lenape people and their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized nations, the Delaware tribe, the Delaware nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie community. I pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build more inclusive and equitable spaces for all. Before I stepped into my current position um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which I will refer to as the PMA, um, I served as the curatorial assistant for the reinstallation of the museum's galleries of early American art. The work that our project team did in preparation for these galleries opening in May of 2021 sparked new collaborations with indigenous communities and has prompted a larger institutional conversation about how we can better collaborate with and serve indigenous peoples. The early American art galleries at the PMA had traditionally shown works of art attributed to European descended colonizers and residents of the early United States. When the time came to rethink these galleries, the project team was committed to enacting a more truthful representation of the many individuals who made and used what we now call early American art. Our project team felt keenly that this broader and more accurate representation must include works produced by indigenous artists who of course have made culturally and artistically significant pieces in the Americas since time immemorial and continue to do so today. Yet we also understood and respected that any historic pieces by indigenous artists should only be included in the galleries if they could be installed and interpreted in consultation with members of the descendant communities of their artists. Complicating this plan was the fact that the PMA does not have a collection of historic indigenous art. In the 1930s and 1940s, the boards of trustees of the Penn Museum and the PMA made a gentleman's agreement to avoid competing over similar collections. Acting upon racial and religious biases, they divided the world's cultures into those that produced art and those that produced artifacts. Indigenous cultures of the Americas were categorized as producing artifacts, and it was decided that they would be collected by the Penn Museum. While some historic works of art by Indigenous North American artists have entered the collection since, generally as part of larger gifts or bequests, the PMA has not systematically collected in this area since then. Thus, any artwork included in our new galleries would need to be a loan borrowed from another institution. To focus these requests, we decided to prioritize pieces made by Lenape artists, this would mirror a larger focus on the region now called Philadelphia in both the gallery narratives and in the museum's other collections of American art. After collating a short list of artworks that we might be able to borrow, we began outreach to members and employees of some of the Lenape nations. We decided to begin with the three federally recognized Lenape nations based in the United States. Because of the violence, broken treaties, fraudulent agreements, and forced displacement that characterize the colonization of this region, these nations are located today in Oklahoma and Wisconsin. We also reached out to the Lenape Center, an arts and culture nonprofit based in New York. We essentially sent cold call emails to individuals in the historic and cultural preservation offices of these nations, explaining our project and asking if they might be willing to meet with us to learn more and received very gracious responses to these emails and ended up meeting virtually and in person back in the days when that was possible with six paid advisors from the three federally recognized nations and the Lenape Center. The, our PMA project team shared the works of art we were considering for display and how we thought they might fit into larger narratives of this suite of galleries. We were grateful for the opportunity to learn more about the artworks from the advisors and for their generous insights into how the pieces might be more accurately presented and interpreted. Their suggestions proved critical as we continued to refine our plans for the galleries. We engaged with our advisors again a few months later in correspondence over the development of a written land acknowledgement which would hang outside of the galleries. The PMA team developed a draft land acknowledgement statement which was sent to each advisor individually for their comments. We synthesized their feedback into a new draft which was circulated to all of the advisors as a group. We then went through about five more rounds of revisions of the statement uh, based on additional feedback and suggestions from the advisors and eventually all came to consensus on a single statement. Um, the statement I read at the beginning of my talk is an adaptation of this final text that we uh, came to consensus upon. As we began developing interpretive text for the galleries, we went through a similar review process with the advisors for all of the texts that addressed Indigenous artists, subjects, and histories, and the labels and presentation of these artworks were all updated based on their input. A recurring refrain throughout our discussions was the insistence that our institution treat the land acknowledgement and the gallery presentation as living commitments, 
as occasions to move from box checking statements, declaring good intentions to a real institutional pledge to collaborate with and better serve contemporary indigenous individuals and communities, particularly the Lenape. While this charge to move from words to actions is something members of our project team and other staff at the institution have taken to heart, we are still working out what this commitment will look like. At the moment, a primary goal is to try to shift this from a project-based relationship carried by a few individuals to something ongoing and carried by staff across the institution. One of our advisors, Curtis Zuniga, who I know is a speaker in part one of this program, um, joined me in a facilitated discussion for our staff and volunteers about land acknowledgements, what they are, why our institution was adopting one, and what it could mean in terms of actions and commitment for staff across the institution. We've also had discussions with our advisors about the potential for future partnerships, and um, in particular, how the museum can better represent the work of contemporary Indigenous artists. We hope to continue to build collaborations with our advisors and with other Indigenous groups and individuals in the area, trying to be a resource and partner for these communities and to more effectively bring Indigenous voices in earlier in our planning processes. The PMA, like many museums, is in a moment of great institutional change. We are excited to harness this moment to work towards the goal outlined in the final draft of our land acknowledgement statement to build more inclusive and equitable spaces for all. Um, so I'll wrap up here. Thanks again for having me here today. And I'm looking forward to um, hearing the rest of the presentations and I'm happy to speak to any questions later. Thank you, Thanks, Rosalie. Rosalie. All right, uh, so our next presenter is um, Brian Carpenter. Um, who is the Curator of Indigenous Materials at the American Philosophical Society Library and Museum. Brian will share general ob observations on ways that archival institutions can make their collections accessible and usable in meaningful ways to Indigenous communities by strengthening the natural, con natural connection between reference and outreach and developing clarity about the Native nations and researchers um, can ask of the institution. And um, Brian, we can see your notes, so you might want to flip the screen share. Uh, okay. That's for that. Mm -hmm. um, is that the correct? Is that coming through correctly? Yep. Yep, okay, thank you very much. Having some technical difficulties here. Um, thank you everyone for um, time to speak with you today. I would like to um, present some info here that is based upon the good advice and generosity of many uh, Indigenous communities, individuals with whom we've had the opportunity to work over many years. Um, I will begin by just giving some context of uh, where the remarks coming from. The APS is one of the major repositories in North America of uh, uh, archival materials related to indigenous peoples, especially linguistic and ethnographic materials uh, from throughout the continent and over uh, many centuries. As you can see from the picture of our library, we are very much the encyclopedia entry picture of the colonial archive. Um, as a result of some very uh, good institutional support. Uh, like I said, a lot of advice and generosity from many indigenous communities with whom we've worked and some donor support. We've established a permanent center to focus on this kind of work. And uh, I, um, the majority of our requests are actually from indigenous communities and we have a chance to work with um, many throughout the continent on a continuous basis. Um, so these, these, these observations I want to share today are um, meant to be useful uh, things to kind of top the list, things that come to mind of ways that we have found it uh, useful to uh, in uh, working with indigenous community researchers and community entities, but these should be applicable to any shape or size of archival institution, especially. So one thing to keep in mind is um, in terms of um, outreach as well as uh, people getting in touch with your institution about what uh, materials are there, there's a wide variety of uh, this constituency in terms of how these, uh, the context of these requests. There may be individual community members and researchers who are coming across your materials in a variety of kinds of ways. And some of the previous presentations have shown a lot of really helpful uh, ways that people can come to find in your institution. Um, these are not necessarily academic requests, though those that's a part of it. Um, very often it's 
much more other kinds of requests. So, uh, Excuse me, Brian. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, there's a note that you're a little difficult to hear. I don't know if you could maybe speak up a bit or it seemed like when you turned your head a certain way, it was your uh, voice was louder. Um, so I don't know if you could do that. Okay. Um, I apologize for that. Um, sorry, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna switch, switch gear here. Is that better? Is that okay? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I apologize. Um, there are also a variety of what I'm calling community entities that may uh, wish to uh, interact with institutional materials. These are a uh, wide variety of tribal government departments across um, tribal governments, of which there are several hundred in the United States, as well as many more in um, in Canada and other nations and other um, countries, there's a wide variety of how these different um, uh, departments are con constructed, uh, their areas of responsibilities, and um, the kinds of materials they may be interested in in your institution. There's also um, sort of sister organizations such as uh, libraries, archives, museums, cultural centers that are based in communities. These are often community run, sometimes as part of government, sometimes they're not. Um, so it's also good to understand the context of those kinds of organizations, as well as uh, educational institutions of various sizes from tribal colleges to um, elementary schools and so forth. Um, and of course there's traditional leadership to people with uh, other responsibilities, which may or may not overlap with some of these other departments. And people often ask, well, how, what, is the, what are ways to do outreach? There are um, you know, planned projects, grants, uh, uh, and so forth, but reference itself is outreach. So I would encourage people to look to that as a, as a way to also to develop relationships. Um, especially meaningful info that we found is useful for people finding materials. Um, and this is important for us because we have a very unusual name, American Philosophical Society that does not sound like a place that would have these kinds of materials. So often people, we try to find out how people have stumbled across us. And uh, very often it's the names of people, uh, name, people saying, I Googled my grandfather's name and I found this photograph, or I Googled my uncle's name and I found that there's this recording. Um, um, and the snack is another, uh, as recent as a way that this is that as well. Names of the communities, not just the cultural names or tribal names, but also towns on specific communities, um, places, uh, locations such as that, that maybe um, people might be searching for. And current names, as well as obsolete names, uh, including some alternate spellings from tribal. Uh, this is a complex issue, of course, um, but often people searching in uh, historic documents may, who themselves know of multiple names, may think that they may need to use an older name in some cases, so it's good to uh, consider this issue um, and how your approach would be to it. Work to make it clear uh, what indigenous community entities or individuals can ask for of from your institution. Uh, what are costs? Can these be waived? Uh, here at APS, we have, are in a situation where we are able to uh, uh, digitize materials for free for community-based requests. Um, Especially if you're doing outreach to a community, you can't then obviously say, and here's the bill for, here's the bill for the uh, digitization. Uh, so this is something to think through in terms of what is, what is possible. Um, and people are, will be understanding of the need uh, uh, to work on this. Uh, usage and rights, um, as well as, uh, this is not just publication, but people wanting to use things in more um, local context as well, as well as uh, we have a lot of uh, cultural centers we work with who want to themselves um, take the digitized materials and make, uh, build up their own uh, institution as the best place in the community, best place in the world for uh, historical materials on, the, on uh, that place. So think about what are both policy level, but also technical levels. How are you sending materials? Um, can they be then um, brought into uh, local archives in an easy way? Another sorry thing. To, uh, sorry to cut you off again, Brian. You have a little less than a minute. Just okay. FYI. Thank you. Thanks. 
Many community members may think that they have to go through third parties in order to access materials at the institution and third parties such as academic uh, facilitators may think that as well. This is because that has for many decades been the case. So it's a reasonable institute uh, impression even if it's no longer the case. So it's important to be aware of this. Um, if this is not the, if this is the case that anyone can access uh, those materials as it should be, be aware that not everyone will necessarily understand that. Um, and final things, some places may have uh, it, departments and people whose job it is to work with external institutions, others might not. Either way, if you're reaching out to people, you need to consider how, how would they be compensated? Do they have time to do this work? Um, individual community members may not want to be put on the spot uh, to be out of being concer concerned that they might be misconstrued as speaking on behalf of their community. So this is a, a, a consideration to have in mind. The, in, uh, departments, entities accessing materials may not be the same as those who make decisions on policies, uh, collaborations, agreements, and so forth. Think about those differences. And overall and everything, be prepared to answer the question, uh, how will this benefit the community? Um, you may be directly asked that, but that should overall govern um, your uh, spirit in which you uh, wish to do outreach with the Native communities. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Sorry for the interruptions. <laughs> um, so our final speaker is Stephen R. Curley. A member of the Diné Navajo Nation, Stephen is a professional archivist who reaffirms that tribal archives stand as monuments to the traditional knowledge systems and age-old institutions which have sustained the cultural memories of tribal peoples. Stephen will speak on the National, Ar National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalitions, National Indian Boarding School Digital Archive slated for a 2022 launch date. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Faith. Um, <clears throat> yeah, first off, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, happy to be here. I, I want to thank pa uh, Paxil, is that you say? Paxil for asking me to join in on these conversations and uh, to listen in on all the great work that uh, you know today's uh, esteemed guests are, are sharing with you all today. So seven minutes is not long enough uh, at all. So I want to encourage you all to follow up uh, with these uh, many great projects and to ask questions uh, for those presented today. Um, I am Stephen Curley. I'm the director of digital archives for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Uh, my role here is really to ensure that uh, our, our policies and workflows incorporate procedures and practices of uh, community collaboration, uh, data sovereignty strategies, and allowing for, for takedown uh, and, and, and making sure that those things are in place uh, as we move forward uh, with digitizing hundreds of uh, thousands of, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of boarding school uh, records and manuscripts, uh, which all of which <clears throat> are sourced from various repositories throughout the nation. So I, I'm glad to, to, be, uh, to be talking to an audience uh, who is well aware of uh, aggregation and who's uh, aggregation minded. So I was, per, I was perusing the, the PARP, the archives uh, research uh, portal uh, earlier, and it's a pretty nifty system, uh, but you all know full well how challenging it is to augment uh, browsability and searchability of collections. Uh, so these are some of the things that, uh, some of the challenges that uh, NIBSTA, the National Indian Boarding School Digital Archive, uh, will meet head on. So let me go to my next slide. Um, <clears throat> so with NABS, so working with NABS, uh, it's really led us uh, to many instances and opportunities uh, to work with tribal nations and communities to really uh, hone in and uh, exact our digitization uh, projects with more input regarding, uh, you know, one, um, what should we digitize, uh, determining that, and two, um, how, how should we proceed with subsequent treatments uh, like, like cataloging and interpret interpretive uh, activities revolving around those records. So uh, just to read off our mission, uh, our mission is to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma created by the US Indian boarding school policy. And so the records is really um, kind of key in sort of determining uh, you know, evidentiary uh, documentation that will assist us in truth telling initiatives. Uh, so I won't read this off, uh, but um, you know, between 1879 and, and 1970s, uh, the U.S. federal government removed thousands of American Indian and Alaska Native children from their homes and families, placing them in assimilative boarding schools 
uh, that were really meant to uh, or intended to strip away their languages, uh, identities, and cultures. So currently, uh, with our research teams um, spearheaded by a gentleman named uh, Dr. Samuel Torres, uh, we have identified uh, 367 schools, which were known to have operated historically. Some of them uh, are, are kind of still in operation. Um, uh, and this list kind of gives you an idea of the, of the magnitude of institutions that we're, we're working with and trying to locate and identify. Um, and the thing that you should know is that uh, the federal government up until recently uh, with the federal initiative that was announced uh, this past June uh, was uh, sort of, uh, unfortunately ha has been languid about examining the ongoing effects of these institutions on Native people today. Uh, and, and, you know, part of it, examining it is knowing baseline information, like one, um, how many schools operated historically? Now we know it's 367. 10 years, we didn't know it was 367. And two, uh, where are the records? So that's kind of the, uh, the, the question subsequent after. Um, uh, and, and these are all things that we're making, uh, we're wanting to know, uh, and we're wanting to establish a a, uh, a sort of controlled environment for understanding and fleshing out uh, that history because it gets very messy um, for, for those of you who are, who are well aware of these records. <clears throat> so the bulk of these institutions, these boarding school institutions were federally ran operations and uh, most of them, uh, most of the records that are associated with these institutions exist at places like NARA, so federal repositories. And uh, here's uh, at the, on the right side column, uh, there's kind of uh, statistics about um, where they exist. So what we're attempting to do is to, again, digitize all boarding school relevant collections housed at NARA or elsewhere, because it's not just at NARA, it could be at historical societies or even small scale um, uh, public institutions like libraries and to really centralize them in a digital platform as uh, the authoritative center for US Indian boarding school history. And that's quite a feat um, and, and one that really, uh, one that we haven't really had a chance to do since uh, pandemic hit in March, 2020, uh, but we're optimistic that a lot of these uh, institutions are gonna start to reopen to researchers so we can get in and uh, do what we need to do when we digitize. So in addition, uh, we were wanting to um, uh, collectively uh, wanting to aggregate data from, our, from other repositories who are currently and actively curating boarding school records uh, there's a gentleman here today uh, from, from Dickinson College who uh, has a, a very seminal and influential uh, um, database that, uh, that he is a coordinator of. Uh, so we have some institutional partners um, who have you know, expressed a desire to, to have NIBS to fulfill this sort of uh, clearinghouse uh, function. So we've been working uh, with them to establish uh, kind of a practical and agreeable workflow for doing so. And, um, you know, again, it, it's really going to be in the, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions uh, of records that will be included in this uh, platform. So I think uh, <clears throat> uh, this is kind of my, my data repository slide. Um, I think a lot of us tend, tend to not think of catalog records as datum, uh, data, but uh, they indeed are. Uh, if leveraged in a specific way, uh, they, can, they can start to produce and yield very interesting kind of new research avenues. And, and of course, uh, this is uh, research that is conducted from the records themselves. And um, as we know, uh, records, uh, these records kind of inform one another. Um, we know that students um, uh, were transferred to other, to other schools. And so it, once we start to uh, create um, sort of a, um, a fuller picture uh, of, of the inner workings of these uh, systems and these institutions, we can kind of build a, and flesh out a, a more sub substantive narrative. Uh, because for one, uh, one of the things that uh, you all need to know is that uh, this is very uh, nebulous. This is a very nebulous history. It's very misunderstood. Um, sort of the, the larger schools kind of uh, take the lion's share of attention uh, regarding scholarly research. And so uh, we, we kind of don't have a nuanced uh, understanding of that landscape historically. Sorry to cut you off, Stephen. You have a little less than a minute left. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to speed it up. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, since we're creating a new uh, powerful resource, we want to make sure that uh, we're doing so responsibly and uh, we are kind of allowing for certain mechanisms of accountability and uh, the ability to take down specifically um, 
because that's one of that's one of the things that we need to adhere to when we're trying to abide by uh, stuff like data sovereignty strategies. So in addition to setting up uh, systems of curation, another large portion of, of my work involves, you know, asking various uh, kind of derivatives of the question, um, how do we apply uh, sensitive protocols to sensitive material and uh, how do we present uh, this traumatic history without further traumatizing. Uh, so these are kind of questions that, uh, of course, relate to responsible stewardship and responsible access. So it's, it's very uh, it's very prudent to have a, a workflow that uh, is kind of reflexive and is receptive and responsive to uh, uh, community interests. Okay, so um, that's our, I'll let you all pause that. I'm sure this record this recording is going to be made available at a later time. <clears throat> Skip ahead. Um, in closing, I think um, we're looking forward to launching this platform uh, next fall, as we mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, we are thankful to the DOI, uh, Secretary Holland, for really legitimizing and taking uh, the examination of uh, this, this boarding school policy seriously, and uh, it, val it validates a lot of uh, NAB's uh, doings uh, over the past decade, um, and also kind of gives us a chance to organize with and, and meet other like like-minded individuals like you all uh, who are now aware of this historic policy. So if you all are interested in becoming members or learning more about our organization, uh, just uh, click on this, um, type it in, you can have to type it in and uh, please visit our website. Uh, I'm happy to, to have gotten to the chance to speak to you all and I'm looking forward to continuing discussions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, so that is all of the presentations. Um, we have a little less than 20 minutes left uh, for Q&A. Um, so like I mentioned, if um, folks want to uh, submit a question in the chat, um, feel free to do that. Or if you want to raise your hand um, and, and we can get started with the questions. And I'll try to navigate around in case someone has their hand raised. Sure, Allison. Sorry to jump in since I presented today too. Um, I was just wondering um, if uh, Jim and Steven, if you had connected with any of the folks I say this partially because it, it's what I did before I moved to the US, uh, who, are, who are working with residential school records in Canada and who went through the TRC digitization process um, and are now trying to navigate like having these huge digital archives that they need to organize sensitively and make uh, records available to communities while still like respecting the right of individuals to take stuff down. Um, mostly because I think that there are a lot, there is a lot of crossover in the work that people are doing, and um, selfishly, I would love to introduce you to people in Canada who are who are also working in this area. If you have not had the chance to meet people yet, um, for myself, I've I've had just a few conversations um, with people. Um, sometimes at uh, NISA meetings or at ATOL meetings, um, just informal conversations, but haven't had any uh, formal collaborations uh, about our shared challenges in, in managing uh, projects of this type. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, for that question. It's a good question. Um, that was one of the things that um, the seven minutes wouldn't allow. So. Um, uh, for NABs, uh, which kind of started in, I think it was 2012, I might be getting that wrong, it was 2012 or 2011, but uh, there's a lot to learn from Canada and uh, in terms of how they've structured their, uh, their, uh, their own commission regarding their residential school systems over there. Um, uh, one of the things that, that NABs, uh, the impetus for NABs is that uh, uh, there, there was a consortium meeting uh, with, with the various tribal leaders who wanted to um, leverage and uh, institute something very similar to that commission in, in Canada. So uh, NABS is kind of the, uh, the, the product of those discussions and uh, NABS has been around for about a decade or so, like I mentioned before. Uh, but in answering your question, um, 
Uh, yeah, the, the NCTR uh, is uh, sort of the, uh, the repository who has sort of organized and sort of maintained uh, all of the records and documentation that were produced uh, during that commission process. And so NT NCTR is uh, the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation that's based out of the University of Manitoba. And so uh, we, we have, I will say that um, uh, we have had uh, a, a, a lot of discussions with them in terms of partnership and how we can uh, begin to organize ourselves collectively so that, um, uh, you know, like I said before, there's a lot of things that we can learn from Canada because they've, al they've already gone through this process. And so fortunately with uh, um, the federal initiative that, that was announced in June, uh, there's been a lot of uh, um, uh, momentum. And so uh, one of the things that, uh, I think I can say this, um, one of the things that we're working uh, with NCTR on is to create a digital map that uh, accounts for the 367 schools that were known to operate in the U.S. historically, but uh, to also have it uh, incorporate um, uh, schools uh, in, in, you know, north of that uh, medicine line border too. So uh, that will be coming out uh, very, hopefully very soon. Uh, we're still, you know, doing a lot of research and, and data capture and data management, and we're still working out the kinks with regards to uh, data sharing and stuff like that, but uh, that should be coming on uh, hopefully by spring, uh, I'm gonna guess, but, uh, and hopefully I'm not jumping the gun and announcing this, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure NABS has announced it before. Thank you though for that question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruth Ann. Thank you, this has been really, really amazing. Um, my question is similar. I'm curious about how we might find out who else is doing research in the same area that we're doing research so that we can dovetail in general. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm also asking, um, are there any good examples for in incentivizing collaboration on research? Um, I can offer information about um, where you can learn more about the October uh, Indigenous Edathon that happened with the Snack Cooperative. Um, that's being um, the Edathon itself was being coordinated uh, by a group of Indigenous advisors, but uh, a coordination group led by Diana Marsh, the University of Maryland, and uh, Catherine Satriano at the Peabody Museum. Uh, and Dina Herbert, a co colleague of mine at the National Archives, who's also a liaison to the SNAC Cooperative. And then, as I said, uh, a group of Indigenous advisors, and Stephen Curley was one of those Indigenous advisors. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat that will take you to more information about what happened in, the, um, in that Edit-a-thon event, which took place back on October 11th and 12th. Uh, I think that's going to be a good pathway to um, more information about collaboration that's happened so far, at least through Snack. Thank you. I think another way to check in on, on projects that people are doing or research that people are doing is when possible, um, like looking at library journals and like archival studies journals as well at, for the more like li library professional stuff. People are often publishing about the work that they're doing. But then beyond that, like with a much lower barrier to entry because those often cost a lot of money to subscribe to if you're not part of an institution that has that subscription. Honestly, like Twitter <laughs> has a lot of that um, the conversational side of collaboration and people talking about the projects that they're working on and connecting with other professionals who are who are working on similar things. Um, I also spend time just like scrolling through, even if I'm not going to a conference, um, like the conference speaker list or panelists and see like who is working on what based on that. Um, and I, I, I mean, I'm always open to getting like cold emailed about stuff. Um, and I am also, because I'm okay with that, uh, also okay with just like shooting someone an email and saying like, hey, I see you're doing this cool thing. Could you tell me more about your project? Um, I think generally speaking, uh, people, people are pretty open to like 
other people being interested in what they're doing, um, especially since like uh, a lot of like librarian and archivist archivist work is so behind the scenes a lot of the time anyway, um, that knowing that there are other people who care about what you care about is always really exciting. I can add one thing, a good, um, uh, for uh, archival uh, institutional work, um, the Native American Archives, Native American Archives section of SAA is a good, uh, has a lot of resources. Um, uh, uh, from videos to publications to a whole range of things. So that's a good um, uh, place to explore. They've done a case studies series, which has various, um, I put the, the sections page in the chat and they've got a whole bunch of things. They've done a webinar series. So it's, it's from sort of practical how-to things. Here's how we did this kind of kinds of things to the broader policy types of stuff as well. So, Oh, and I mentioned this in my presentation, but Brian spurred it again, and I'll put a link in the chat too, to the American Indian Library Association. Thank you. Those are great resources. Are there any other um, questions? I think um, if people are still mulling things over thinking, I think maybe one question that um, the facilitators have, <laughs> Kayla and I, um, is, I mean, you know, Stephen mentioned these talks were on the shorter side. So we're kind of curious if any of the presenters wanted to mention, you know, maybe one or two things that they didn't get to um, during their talk that they wanted to highlight or, or didn't get a chance to to talk about. I could ask one more question. Being an amateur and very passionate, I'm sure that no one could find me. I'm not going to be in any journal or a conference speaker, but I have uncovered some amazing stuff and I, I long to have the opportunity to verify what I'm finding. And so maybe there's there's a need for amateurs to learn how to present what they're finding so that it can be found by other researchers also. You could do that in Snack. <laughs> um, and if you're interested, um, Ruth Ann, in uh, considering our training program called the Snack School, Snack School is always free and membership in the cooperative is free. And it takes, we take you through uh, all of the steps involved in creating and then later editing uh, snack uh, authority descriptions for creator and subject entities, and then linking to the materials themselves, the archival collections themselves. So in a way of working with others to help find things and share what you found, uh, that might be one way to go. And we'd love to have you. Thank you. Wanishi Wanishi. <laughs> yeah, um, although I'm, I didn't present, um, that question kind of makes me think of kind of conversations and literature that have been happening in the archives profession of trying to think of ways um, particularly on finding aids websites or various discovery portals to kind of implement technology to allow researchers to contribute in those ways, um, kind of as like an interpretive layer, you know, 
a layer of analysis on top of kind of traditional archival description. Um, so I, I don't know if anything concrete is happening along those lines or if anyone knows anything about that, but um, that's definitely, um, you know, I think I can, I can mention a discussion um, that has happened in the, the archives world over the past several years, at least. Um, I don't know about on the, the library side of things necessarily. Um, I mean, Ia put, uh, mentioned, just mentioned this in a comment, but um, Amukadu, yeah, uh, does a lot of that, like allowing for some feedback or speaking back to archival resources. Um, and I know that like collective access, which is, yes, collective access, um, which is another CMS system also has the ability to allow for comments on archival and library materials as well, because it, it can be used to make like a hybrid system. Um, the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC uses collective access, and that's one of the things that we built into the system when we uh, put it together is that ability for community members to add um, information about things we have, because oftentimes the institution that is holding stuff is, is not the expert on, on those materials, and often those the descriptions that are attached to archival records are like super outdated. They were written by someone who's non-Indigenous, who, uh, you know, especially with photographs, like has no idea who these people are and it would be great to be able to identify them. Um, and that is, that is common across other types of collections as well. Thanks for that. Um... I, I wasn't quite familiar, but I, I definitely understand the, the process, which is cool. And I think part of why Mukutu is so awesome, uh, specifically regarding, you'll have to pardon my dog barking in the background, um, is that the, the cultural protocols that are in place kind of can allow people to feel more, more safe, in my experience, where people might not be as encouraged to provide commentary on certain things but if certain items only have access by community members, then you know maybe they are more likely to share. Um, I have some like not blood related, but I have like close friends of the family up in Savunga, um, the Yupe village, and that's like one of their big things is like organizing on Facebook and like groups and stuff. That normally it's more like restricted and like um not heavily but like people are more comfortable to comment and share information regarding certain items as long as they know who's in the chat so that's kind of one of the um big pushes for muku to has the system because it has that commenting ability it's um and if you can tell a community member is like hey just think of it kind of like facebook but you know who the audience is um they're way more uh, it seems to click way better. So I've been excited to do that. Um, Marge, I see your questions. Um, I, I think the big thing is the protocols that are in place. So, you know, you can identify certain community members and certain access roles. Um, and you can even do access roles for people on the back end too, which is particularly cool um, for Muku too. Um, I don't really like that. I know that's kind of a drop in the bucket as far as the CMS goes, but it seems rather unique. To have that built in already. Thank you. Um, so we are at 429. Uh, so I guess we should wrap this up. Yes, um, so thank you to all of our presenters and attendees to, uh, for joining us today. If you have a few minutes, we'll be sharing a brief survey uh, about the event in the chat, if you could please fill it out. Um, and we'll leave the survey open um, for a week or two. Uh, please stay tuned for any future PAC school events that are going to um, come up in 2022. Um, yeah, and thank you for joining us.
Thanks, everyone. Yeah, well, I don't know if you just said this, Kayla, but we'll send an email out um, oh, through perfect. Eventbrite, I think, with the survey link, too, in case people didn't miss that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.